So this is welcome, you know, this is our fourth NeuroBiz Now gathering. Um, and, uh, you know, just as a means of background, our intent for this is, you know, for this to be a weekly video conference discussion series um, with the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative, um, where each session focuses on a topic um, that has neuroscience and business implications of broad interest, but also is relevant to current events. Um, so today's topic aims to explore um, the neuroscience of leadership, a big topic area like we always seem to hit. Um, so, I, so I think this will be a really fantastic discussion. Um, we've pulled together a really fantastic group of panelists for today's discussion. Uh, and I will uh, introduce them briefly um, and then uh, pass over the so-called mic uh, soon um, and, uh, and, begin the, and begin the formal uh, program. But just as a reminder, the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative is here to bring together brain science and business uh, in an effort to improve business, uh, drive new discoveries and applications, and enhance the education of future leaders. Um, Michael Platt is the faculty director of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative, and he will serve as a co-moderator with me. He's a professor of marketing, neuroscience, and psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and the Wharton School. Uh, and I'm Zab Johnson. I'm the executive director and senior fellow uh, for the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative. Um, and we will serve together as the co-moderators for today's panel discussion. Um, and our, and uh, the, the way that the program works uh, best in our experience is, is to let each of the panelists uh, give a brief overview of their perspective on the topic. Um, and then uh, while that's happening, if, if you end up having questions as attendees and audience members, what we would suggest is that you start to put those into the chat window, uh, which you'll find uh, on the settings part of the right part of your screen. Um, and that will allow us to know what your question is, but actually to, to create a, you know, the idea of connecting and you know, human contact in these difficult times. Uh, uh, when your question is relevant to our discussion, I will actually invite you to come on video um, and uh, on camera uh, and ask your question directly, but I will, uh, I'll moderate those. So sometimes, you know, it takes us a while to get to the questions. And so if you put them into the chat window, it not only gives us an idea of the relevance and who you might be addressing your questions to and when would it would be the most appropriate for us to ask those questions. Um, but it also allows you to remember what your questions might have been if it, it had taken a little while for us to get to them. Um, so that's, uh, that's generally you know, how, we'll, how we'll run things. Um, so to introduce today's fantastic panelists, um, we have uh, Mike Hussein, who is the Professor of Management um, and Faculty Director of the Wharton Center for Leadership and Change Management. We have Christian Ruff, who's the Professor of Neuroeconomics and Decision Neuroscience at the Department of Economics at the University of Zurich. Uh, Talia Wheatley is Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Dartmouth. And Jonathan Kirshner, who's the CEO and founder of Air Consulting, which is a leadership development coaching company. And they are also a corporate partner of the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative. All right, so, um, so I'll get us started, and I think we'll start with, uh, with Mike Usim. Well, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of an intro with your vast experience uh, in leadership and, um, and changing behavior. All right, well, Zab, thank you, and hello, everybody. Um, happy noonday, or in the case of Christian, it must be around 6 p.m. I see a few faces there are people I know, and I just wanna do a quick shout out to, um, Catherine, I see you, Len, Richard Marcus, uh, Lou Padulo. Great to have um, people we know. Uh, I see a nice wave there from Richard. So anyway, nice, nice to see you. A couple thoughts on the moment. I'm gonna pick up on the theme, the neuroscience of leadership by referencing um, the moment we're in that we all think about uh, pretty much all day, certainly at news time, to, to make a very short argument and that is we are riveted by the uh, expression or sometimes the shortcomings in the leadership that we see. Maybe uh, take it either way at the White House, uh, the governor of New York. And I think that's because research reminds us unequivocally that leadership becomes more vital when there's uncertainty. And uh, number two, uh, leadership is um, a collective skill and not an individual skill set. I'll come back to the latter in a few minutes, but let's take uh, the first. I think the fact that we know from research and intuitively that research 
that leadership rather is really vital when, uh, in this case, the world seems to be going to hell, uh, leads, le leads to uh, the following totally obvious question. What exactly is it that we're looking for when we see the governor of New York speak or, or the president of the United States speak? And from my own intuitive experience and lots of research to go with it, I would say keep in mind three absolutely vital capacities or, or skill sets, if you will. Number one, uh, to think strategically, to think strategically. Number two, to communicate persuasively. And number three, to act decisively. My maybe illustrative case in point for thinking strategically goes back a couple of years uh, to our last enormous crisis, and that is the financial setback of 0809. And um, having spent time back then and more recently with the chief executive then of Vanguard, he stepped down, but Bill McNabb ran Vanguard as CEO for uh, 10 years. He came in just before 0809 uh, came crashing down, and he made a decision, it was controversial at the time, to cut salaries, cut expenses, but lay nobody off. Uh, it was next year for an asset manager like Vanguard, uh, that was extremely tough to achieve, but he theorized, he was thinking strategically that as the market came back, and it would and did, um, having people um, committed to the firm and on, on payroll at the firm, he would have in place what was gonna be required when there was later a huge flow of assets into Vanguard's hands. And that's one reason that Vanguard is pushing $6 trillion in assets now, because Bill McNabb was thinking strategically at a time when his uh, thinking, had it not been quite that strategic, might have headed in a different direction. I'm gonna skip um, illustrating, we can come back to it, to the other two elements, communicating persuasively and acting decisively. But let me address one of the themes that uh, Zab and Michael have put together for our discussion. And that is the extent to which these are natural kind of inborn skills built into our wiring or acquired. And for my two cents at this moment, let me just make an argument to put a stake in the ground. Uh, some have a head start on all three, but all three are uh, strengthenable, if that's even a word, by the people that we work with, not to mention ourselves. The last point I want to finish, and then I'll turn it back to Zab here, with is the fact that leadership is not only about you thinking persuasively, or Bill McNabb thinking persuasively, it's about all of us. And one of the other great research findings of my field is that when leadership is collective, not single, when it's the team and not the individual, it works much better, has much greater consequence. And that's why to finish off then on this point, we have seen without any direction from the White House or the governor's office or a mayor's office, many people stepping forward, sometimes running small restaurants, maybe a medical center, maybe it's just a neighborhood that they take some responsibility for and thinking strategically, communicating persuasively and acting decisively. So there it is, a couple of thoughts, says Ab, back to you. Great, thanks very much, Mike. So I think um, that's a that's a really nice lead up of, of the ideas around leadership. So we'll turn now to Christian Ra, who has you know a really long uh, experience, really doing diving into the neuroscience of not just decision making, but actually you know the, the sort of indicators from a neuroscience perspective. What what you know what do we have? What what can you bring to the table around what the neurosciences can tell us about leadership, Christian? Yeah, um, thanks first for putting together this great symposium. I'm actually glad that I can basically pitch my ideas directly after what we heard now, because the question was asked, what is it that we're looking for in leaders? And that's exactly the question that we tried to examine in, in a recent study, actually, uh, in with neuroscience methods. Um, so the hope is, and that also chimes in with what we heard before, is that we can really learn something about some elementary skills that leaders have to show and that have to be set up in their brain 
Um, and I think that's essential for, find, for assessment, of course, so for identifying people who have a natural inborn talent, but I also fully agree with what was said before, training is essential here. We need to know what it is that we have to train. So in order to um, find out what that could be from a neuroscience perspective in our experiment, we actually invited participants to our lab um, uh, and we knew whether these people actually were good leaders in real life. So how do we know that? Well, that's uh, a strike of good luck that we're in Switzerland where all the males have to do several years of military service and they can rise through the ranks. So we have real life measures of how much, how much uh, people actually take on leadership challenges and actually also succeed in doing so. Uh, and then we actually measure decision making. So um, I just wanna point out, there's obviously many different things that leaders have to get right. And we heard three just now, uh, but we focus in particular on decision making style and how your brain processes the world and uses that to guide your behavior. And that's what we look at. And that's what we want to uh, see whether there's particular characteristics here that make good leaders. And the way that we do it is that we have people take choices that have real financial consequences. So they participate in lotteries. They can win a certain amount, lose a certain amount. Uh, there's uncertainty associated. We heard that that's crucial, right? Um, people may know what the probabilities are, or there may even be global uncertainty. They may not know what the probabilities are. And then we can look whether there's anything particular about decision-making styles of people that, uh, that uh, differentiates good leaders from bad leaders. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing in these individual decisions. The good leaders are not those who are very risk-taking or not very risk-taking. They're not people who are afraid of losses or not afraid of losses. Like all of that, our experiments suggest you can discount. However, in our experiments, we also look at leadership directly. How do we do that? We have people take these choices either just for themselves or for a group of people. So all of a sudden they have to take responsibility for others, take leadership. And we can look now, how, does the brain, how do the brains of people process this information when they lead versus when they just decide for themselves? And what is it about this, these differences that differentiate good leaders from bad leaders? And something that was quite interesting here is the good leaders were not people who actually wanted to take uh, a lot of choices themselves or delegate to the group or who uh, actually involved the others uh, in their choices. All leadership styles were present in the good leaders. The main characteristic that we found in good leaders was that they took their choices always in the same way, no matter whether they chose for themselves or whether they chose for the group. So you could have very careful leaders, good leaders, and they were careful when they took choices for themselves and for the group, and you could have people who uh, basically were very risk-taking, but they always, the good ones always did it uh, in the same way, no matter whether it was just for themselves or for others. And um, it was quite striking that this was the only thing that predicted whether people actually were good leaders in real life. There were also some neural processes associated with that. I won't bore you with these, uh, but I just want to put into this round that I think the recent events have really shown that uh, it's not, this is not just uh, something that uh, makes people good leaders, but we look for that in good leaders. And I noticed that when I saw that a clip of Angela Merkel, who's hardly a very uh, charismatic leader, <laughs> went viral. Uh, and that, viral, that clip basically just showed her explain in a very calm manner what her criteria are for deciding when to reopen the country. Uh, she, she mentioned transmission, transmi transmission uh, indices and so forth. But she, she just very calmly explained, this is how we have to take the decision and that's how we do it. And people seem fascinated by this. And I think it is because we realize whether someone has as principles and sticks, sticks to these, no matter whether they decide for themselves or for, for the group. Uh, and I think there's many examples also of what people see as bad leadership at the moment, where we just get the nagging suspicion that people choose not to solve a problem by some established criteria that they apply to themselves, but to follow other other aims. And I don't have to name any names here. Uh, yeah, so that's, I think, what our research puts into this round. Again, I want to repeat, I'm not saying that there's not many other things that leaders need to get right. I fully agree with what we heard before. I think I know what Talia is going to say, and I also agree with this. Uh, and it's just important that we all uh, keep putting these things together. Uh, and try to see what, so to say, the skill set is that good leaders need. And I think our research contributes one of these skills. Great, thank you very much. So uh, you've pointed us to Talia, so, uh, so I'll let her uh, go ahead and, and speak next. 
thanks, uh, thanks, Bab and um, Michael for putting this together. Um, Christian, I'm not sure what you thought I was going to say, but uh, I'm Tali Wheatley, and uh, most of my career has been studying social intelligence or how people understand other people's thoughts, feelings, and actions. Um, I use a variety of techniques. I don't know how much of it we'll get into today, but from neuroimaging, so fMRI, EEG, eye tracking, psychophysics, behavioral studies, cross-cultural research, and um, I've been using all of these techniques for a long time now, but up until about five years ago, I was studying social intelligence in the way psychology and neuroscience have always studied these things, which is in the individual. Um, so all of neuroscience, if you think about it, is about mapping the human brain in the singular. And I started to realize that we know very little about how brains interact, and yet we do this all the time. So it must be, there must be some purpose that we get together and our minds couple and we influence each other. And leadership, as I think Mike put so well, is collective. So if we want to understand leadership, I think we have to understand the collective brain and how people interact and influence and shape each other's minds. So I'm one of the few neuroscientists, along with Michael Platt here, I think, that is invested in moving neuroscience toward an interactive approach. And I want to tell you just a little bit about a study that we just completed. Um, we didn't set out to study leadership. We didn't give people leadership questionnaires or uh, wasn't the intent. But what we did do was we took people who are highly influential in a real world social network. So the real world social network we used are um, Tuck MBA students. So Tuck is the business school at Dartmouth. We took the entire cohort, uh, 256 of them, and we graphed out their social network and we took people who were highly central in that network. Now, highly central people are people who are well-connected to well-connected others. They influence, they control information flow. And we took them and we took other people that were less central. And I'm not sure I have time to go into the details of the study. It was a neuroscience study, but to give you a little summary of what we found and why I think there are implications for leadership is that we found that people who are highly central in their real world social network are cognitively adaptable. So they take on board other people's ideas rather than dig in their heels. Most of the time in a group, they are not the originators of the best idea but they, can, they have a good nose for when they hear a good idea and they flex to others' positions. I think this takes um, some degree of humility to have this kind of adaptability. But when they hit upon a good idea, wherever it comes from, not only do they change their own mind, and we showed that in, in terms of their neural activity, but they change their own mind and they play an outsized role in uniting people around that idea and bending other people's neural patterns around that common ground. And the degree to which these people in particular talk in a group is directly predictive of how cohesive that group becomes, how much they achieve neural synchrony in the group. So these people uh, don't necessarily have the idea to start with, but they find that idea they flex to it, they take it on board, and then they champion and support that idea and the group becomes united around it. So I think that has implications for leadership. I think it dovetails um, with Mike Yassim's work a lot, um, but I'd be curious to know what people think of it. Great. So this is the main study I've done that is kind of touches upon the leadership idea. Great. Thanks very much, Talia. All right, so I think now we'll we'll uh, let Jonathan Kirshner get on um, and talk a little bit about you know what it's what it is to to work in the leadership capacity as a practitioner, uh, especially you know when when people are really seeking um, now you know to define new ways of thinking about leadership during difficult times. Thank you, Zab. Sure, um, and and thank you so much for having me on this panel. And it's, it's really cool to be. You know, on a panel with giants in our in our field, um, perhaps I'm a bit differentiated in that I'm not a professor um, or a researcher, uh, certainly a thinker, but um, can speak more to the applied nature of, of this work. And um, and so, Jonathan Kirshner, I'm a business psychologist, and so I've trained clinically and organizationally, and also the founder and CEO of Air Consulting. And um, our mission at Air Consulting is really to um, improve people's lives through change. 
And we think doing that through leadership is a pretty strategic way because leaders do have a disproportionate influence on a system. And so if we can help a leader become more effective and be their best self, then that's gonna really maximize the impact of the work we do. And so we do that um, practically through one-to-one -one executive coaching, team effectiveness and leadership development services. So I wanted to share just a few thoughts on um, sort of our, our um, understanding of leadership and um, you know where we are at right now. Um, the way I would uh, define or, or conceptualize leadership is that it's a combination of behaviors and attitudes that really enable someone, i.e. the leader, to actualize or execute on vision, importantly, through others. And I think that's what differentiates a leader from, say, a contributor or a, a, a brilliant inventor. It's that other piece, that piece around with the collective that Mike was sharing about. And, you know, effective leaders are really good at it. Um, the outcomes are achieved in a sustainable way and not good leaders or ineffective leaders, um, the outcomes tend to not get achieved or if they are achieved, they're done. So with a lot of collateral damage and, and risk um, that's been taken. And so um, uh, our core sort of belief around leadership um, which I, I would think is, is fairly consistent among the panelists on this call, is that it's not necessarily a biological trait, but rather something that can be learned and cultivated. And, um, and that's really the, the foundation of our, our business. Uh, and that's what we do day in and day out at Air Consulting is really helping leaders change and shift their, their behavior to be their very best self. Um, that's not to say that nature can't help, but but we do think a good bulk of this um, comes down to nurture, and um, and specifically um, the domains that we think are important within leadership are self leadership, um, how we manage our core, um, energy management, time management, productivity, our resilience, um, interpersonal leadership. So how effectively are we navigating um, the personal realm through emotional intelligence, relationship management, um, team leadership? So how do we harness the collective team um, to really accomplish and execute on, on the mission? And, uh, and then something that we would call business leadership, which is sort of establishing a vision, um, a strategy to get to that mission and driving change. Um, there's not one, uh, there's not like a one silver bullet of leadership style. And, and that really speaks a lot to, I think, the situational leadership uh, literature. And so to be a great leader in a turnaround situation is a lot different than being a great leader in a maintenance situation, um, which is much different than being a great leader in a high growth uh, situation. And so the, uh, the skills and competencies required are very much dependent on the situation itself. And right now the situation we're in is um, you know, quite unprecedented. It is technically, I think, a crisis, but um, you know, we, we can think of this as an existential crisis. It's turning more into like an existential journey and figuring out what's going on. And the advice that we are giving leaders is to um, to really adapt their behaviors to um, to four core um, areas and we call it be real be strong be generous and be multi-dimensional and so being real is all about authenticity um, and um, being strong is all about resilience and um, being generous this is a time right now where compassionate leadership is extremely important and then the piece on multidimensional, um, you know, the studies, there's some great studies done, uh, a great study done at Harvard um, around coming out of the recession, the organizations that thrived the most were the ones that weren't, that didn't go on the offense, didn't go on the defense exclusively, but rather balanced the two and were able to take defensive measures and also aggressive measures out of risk, but nevertheless, um, what would be considered offense and those are the companies that really thrived coming out of the financial crisis. And that, that's really the sort of advice we're giving leaders today is like, how do you balance those two? And it's much harder to be multidimensional than unidimensional. And it's the, the polarities um, cut across many domains. So how do we be really compassionate and empathic, but also drive performance? How do we focus on strategy 
and, and adaptability, but also driving execution. So you know, the sort of polarities that we need to reconcile and carry, it makes leadership probably more complex than ever. And yet that's the task at hand um, that we're seeing and, uh, and, and also the opportunity. So I'll stop there, but um, thank you, Zeb. And Great, thanks. So uh, so I have a question right off the bat, Talia. Um, so you've talked about these sort of, and we've also received a, a question about this, but you know, around the, the super influencers or the social brokers, um, you know, is there, is there something that's sort of innate uh, to their to their brains and to their minds um, that that you know that leads them to that. Um, do they are they the most likely to be you know taking on um, the true leadership role or uh, or is this you know something that is you know inherently a, just a really vital part of teamwork um, where it's really hard to uncouple you know the team from 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 what we traditionally think about leadership. Right. I think um, I would love for the story to be, I'd love for the, the data told us that if everybody talked an equal amount and everybody's contribution was worth the, the same thing, that, that, that the best outcomes, the, the best synchrony happened in those situations. We're not seeing that. We're seeing that a strong leader um, emerges and that person is almost certainly a person who has centrality in their actual social network. So there's something about these people in particular that kind of guide a group and direct a group towards a common vision that's really important. Um, so it's not sort of everybody's on equal footing necessarily. There is something about these people. Now, what it, what it is, we don't really know. We, um, we know that people who tend to have hold highly central uh, positions in their network are, have a kind of social flexibility. Um, you, you mentioned social brokers. If you think about brokerage and a network, um, we have found um, in, a, in a completely different data set uh, with, with eight cohorts of MBA students that the social brokers uh, in those networks tend to be people who kind of adapt themselves to different others. Um, so there's a, a, a social intelligence there that they're able to take on the kind of um, mannerisms, et cetera, of the other person and adapt to them. But beyond that, I'm not completely sure what makes someone um, become highly central. We just know that those people seem to have a disproportionate influence on bending the trajectories of other minds. Uh, thanks, Talia. I, I just wanted to follow on that. <clears throat> um, as you mentioned, we've also been using social network analyses to try to understand um, minds and how minds work together collectively uh, and individually. And um, in our studies of non-human primates, our cousins, which share so much of their biology and behavior with us, uh, rhesus macaques, for example, they form highly complex interconnected social networks and we found that those monkeys who are those information who are those brokers in the networks who who are really central that at least part of of that is genetic so obviously you know your position in a network can't be genetically determined but the qualities that you have as an individual so the what you bring to the table when you're born in terms of your traits and your skills um, and your temperament somehow allow you know allow a particular monkey to become highly central and another monkey to not and what's really kind of remarkable about this is that if that monkey moves to another group that monkey will attain a very similar kind of position so it's it's there's something to there's something biological to to the to that confers um, that those kinds of qualities on on an individual at least in, in terms of monkeys now it's not 100% of the genetic, you know, 100% of the variance is genetic. It's, you know, it's more like 20% to, to 30%, but nevertheless, it suggests that there is a pretty strong biological component. I had a question um, before, oops, sorry, Christian, I didn't want to cut you off. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to ask Talia something as well, because we're at that um, uh, topic. Um, did you also look whether the good leaders uh, were also very flexible at taking on board ideas that they didn't get in a social context? So, so does this really have something to do with being able to interact with others and take on good ideas of others and spread them in the network? 
or is it that they perhaps are just very intellectually flexible and able to see th see different perspectives very well? So, like, have you looked at that as well? We haven't. It's a great it's a great idea. Uh, we've only looked at we've only taken people and put them in these these social groups and had them. We make them have to come to decisions under high uncertainty. Um, and that's the very specific kind of context that we've been using. But this is a great idea of whether or not this cognitive flexibility generalizes to all sorts of domains. But we haven't yet looked at that. Yep, because I mean, one one may wonder to what degree it has something to do with what we heard uh, in the very first contribution, thinking strategically, right? And I think thinking strategically really requires that you're able to simulate many possible scenarios and think what would happen if and so forth. And I think one of the big questions in neuroscience, which I think we should also bring here always, is whether there are specific abilities that are only in the social domain or that really transcends many different domains, right? And and I think this yeah. particular one, um, I really wonder uh, to what degree that contributes to network centrality and leadership in that case. Hey, Zab, can I uh, jump in? This is Mike. I've got a question for both Michael and uh, Natalia here. Uh, Michael, just uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the, well, all your results, but one in particular, that is as a primate moves from group one to group two, they have a head start when they come into group two in terms of their cent centrality and, and their presence and the impact. Having said that, um, do we also find, this is a genuine curiosity question, that they can grow in that new context? If if there's um, purpose or incentives to grow, can they take what they have? They have a head start and then grow. And then over to Talia, uh, really interested to hear more about what you might call emotional contagion. Uh, the extent to which, and I'll put it in a leadership framing here, if you're with people who are prone to take charge, get out, make a difference, speak uh, articulately, uh, do people around them as a really just a, as a product of emotional contagion tend to become better when they see leaders in action around them at the art of leadership. But uh, anyway, let's go back to Michael and then over to Talia. Yeah, thanks for the question, Mike. I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting question. I mean, how you measure uh, growth um, <laughs> in a non-human primate is a little bit, um, a little bit tricky. But um, one of the things that we're finding right now, as you as you may know, we've been studying a population of monkeys on an island off the coast of Puerto Rico for about 12 years now. And we've been uh, studying their behavior and their biology. And of course, as we're all aware, um, Puerto Rico was hit by Hurricane Maria in 2017. And um, not only did it devastate the human population on the island, but devastated our, our primate population. Uh, and that's a really interesting um, event to uh, look at, the changes that have transpired from before the hurricane to after. Um, one of the things that we find is that, um, just like in humans, uh, after this uh, really um, you know, intense, stressful um, uh, event, monkeys seek out social support. And those monkeys who are more central within the social network seem to be better at uh, reaching out and making new connections with others. And so that's a very um, new finding, but it does suggest that um, you know, even when, if you come into the game you know, kind of already with a leg up, that puts you in a better position to access more individuals, which can also you know, provide social support, but also knowledge and other kinds of things like that. So um, you know, like the way I always put it for, for everything that we study, whether we're talking about how we connect socially or um, you know, our ability to kind of engage in divergent thinking. Everybody's dial set a little bit differently when they come to the table, but that dial can be turned, right? It's just that you can take maybe somebody who said it's a seven and turn them to a 10, but maybe not a, somebody who said it a three and take them to a 10. So there's some dynamics there and that's where the training and the, the growth can happen, but there's, a, there's only a limited range, right? Not everybody can be uh, not everybody can be a 10, not everybody can be an Andrew Cuomo or an Angela Merkel, uh, as we're all finding out, uh, unfortunately. Great, thanks. Uh, and then Talia, on emotional contagion as a self-reinforcing, helping us all rise up as better leaders. What do you think? 
Ah, it's a great question. Well, we know that uh, how how your connectivity in your network um, really determines how sort of far and wide your ideas will spread, right? Um, and one thing we've learned in the study that I told you about a little bit is that I think this is out of one of your papers, Mike, um, that if your words don't stick, you haven't spoken. Does that ring a bell? All right, and these these people, their words really stick, right? They words stick, they change people's minds in the group. And I've got to imagine that emotion works the same way, that people are not just paying attention to the words people say, but their tone of voice, how they say it. And this probably also feeds into um, charisma, if you're interested in sort of that in part, in part of, as part of leadership, but sort of uh, inspiring people both with your words and the way you convey those words in terms of your emotional tone. I think both of those things have to go together. So, but I haven't studied it, but I assume maybe other people on the panel uh, have done some work in this area, but I presume that leaders not only um, have greater sort of, uh, ability to push their ideas further out in the network, but emotions as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question for everybody on the panel, and I and I you know might may require kind of just stepping outside of your comfort zone. Um, but my question is, uh, why do we as human beings need leaders? So we all feel an acute need right now for leadership. Um, that seems very different from what we find in animals, where there isn't the same kind of leadership that we see in human beings. And I wonder if it's, you know, it's the nature of our, our societies, the scale of societies, um, what, might we, what might we learn from examining small scale societies or different, different kinds of cultures? Uh, Michael, it's a really good question because you've got us all kind of stalled out here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin with an example and then over to uh, Christian and others here. Um, here's my A case for that point. Uh, I've long used mountaineering as a metaphor for thinking about the world. And mountaineering expeditions, let's make it mount, to Mount Everest, uh, usually have a designated climbing leader. Um, Ed Hillary was not, somebody else was on his expedition, but the leader of that expedition, a guy named John Hunt, put together resources, people, Sherpas, got their weather right, and got uh, two people to the summit way back in 1953. By contrast, I have an example that I've written about of a group that showed up at base camp. Wonderful to be there, spectacular, everybody's read about it. And the person in charge, quote, in charge said, I don't believe in leadership and everybody's gonna do what they're really good at, which is to climb the mountain. Well, the next four or five days, uh, kind of it was anarchy uh, in that people decided to carry loads up to high camps at, at their own choosing in terms of time and, and uh, destination. And I don't think they got above camp two. Not that two cases make the point, but isn't it a matter of, and you raise like, like the baseline question, is leadership all that important? And I think the answer from example is yes, and then statistically, great study uh, done this past year of sport professional and collegiate sports teams, when you uh, changed out a managing, uh, the manager or, or, or the coach, whether it's collegiate or the NFL or NBA, and uh, everything else being equal, uh, a person who brings a leadership skill set led to a better performing team. So we can get it anecdotally, we can get it statistically. But I love the question because it's important to raise it. So why do we spend time on the topic? And I think the answer is we do for the following reasons. Anyway, sorry to go on so long about that. Yeah, perhaps I can I can chime in and, uh, and um, answer that from a biological point of view. So you actually ask, why do we need leaders and animals don't? I think it has to do with the fact that we have a very, very wide area of behaviors that we can show, and we like to act together as a group. In fact, this is why humans took over the world, because they can team up with genetically unrelated strangers and work together with a division of labor. Everyone does different things, 
But the problem is, this is a very, very complex behavior to show. And um, there's several things that we humans have evolved that animals don't have to deal with that. One is social norms, right? So we, we're very good at forming expectations of what we ought to do in a particular situation because we couldn't regulate every aspect of this team uh, at all times. The problem is, what do we do in situations for which we don't have clear social norms, where we don't know what we ought to do? And I think that's where leaders come in. That's why we need leaders, because not everyone in the team can basically uh, decide what they're going to do now, right? We need a direction here. And if there's no norms, we need someone, and we even have norms for how we determine who that person is, right? Politics, elections, and so forth, to basically tell the group what they ought to do. But as with all social norms as well, and I think that's what we're seeing at the moment with uh, democ democracy and politics, and it's dangerous, uh, leadership requires consent and acceptance, right? Uh, um, and um, yeah, um, I think we're really at, at a bit of a breaking point here, right? Where at least in some societies, people, people feel that the direction that the group is headed in uh, by the person designated to do it doesn't actually correspond to what the group actually wants, right? And I think that's, that's when the problem starts. So I think leadership is our solution to the problem that we are too free to do too many things because we're so powerful as a group, but it's also our curse in a way, right? Because leaders can lead us in directions that we don't want. Um, and that's when, when troubles start, when re revolutions happen and so forth. But let's hope it doesn't get to there. <laughs> Christian, I love what you're sharing. If I could um, piggyback on a few and Michael, awesome question. I mean, it's got for five, uh, it's pretty lit up right now um, in me, <laughs> and it makes me think about what's sort of distinctive um, between you know humans and animals. And I think to one, it's complexity, Christian, like to your point, um, and uh, and the other, I think there's something about humans that uh, we're, we're now this inclination to be ambitious. So like the 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 monkeys in Puerto Rico aren't necessarily scheming for how they're going to take over. Um, you know, the rest of the Caribbean. They're, they're more just content on how do we get, you know, maybe maximizing banana output um, and <laughs> and um, being effective in in my own sort of radius. And so um, somehow I think the uh, the combination of those two variables, and maybe there's more, but uh, the complexity and and our ambition, um, you know, presents uh, just an exponential array of challenges and opportunities. And, and somehow, um, maybe this is where evolutionary uh, psychology comes in, somehow to adapt to those conditions, we need um, people to help navigate that complexity and help maximize the opportunity relative to the ambitious pursuit. I'm curious what, what others are, but that's where my philosophizing goes. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, I, I mean, I love those thoughts from both of you. Um, actually, I, I'd love to hear the two of you riff on um, the ideas that the, I think both of you brought up, which is authenticity and consistency. So, um, you know, are, are those related, um, you know, in terms of behavior, and are they related in terms of what we know about the brain? Well, I mean, authenticity and con con consistency are ideally related, but sometimes they aren't. You can have someone who's very authentic but changes their mind all the time, you know? uh, and and perhaps even is authentic about applying double standards when it uh, when different situations happens. And and I think we humans are just very sensitive to detect uh, cheaters, people who basically break out of the social contracts that we have that assign roles to humans in societies. And I think when it comes to our leaders, we're really mainly actually looking for, for consistency because the problem is that people can say a lot, but actions speak louder than words. So I think we're more sensitive to observing people do different things uh, in different settings and then believing that perhaps they're not actually act, putting their money where their mouth is. Yeah, I, I would um, piggyback on that, you know, there's, there's consistency and the adaptability would be of a, of, a, of a polarity. And, um, and I think it's, it's important to be consistent and at the same time, it's important to adapt to the conditions. What enables you to have both is, is humility. 
and and those who don't have humility and we can look at uh you know there's there's definitely a lot of examples of that right now um they're not going to be able to manage that multi-dimensionality between um, consistency um, and adaptability so so well i think on, on the authenticity i think this actually connects very well to emotional contagion if i'm going to be following somebody right now in this time do i want to follow a leader who's pretending like everything is business as usual and everything and he's strong and fuck up or do i want to follow a leader who's like like it's okay to be human and guess what we're all human right now and who's able to not only um, set the conditions for psychological safety um, and, and interpersonal effectiveness, but also demonstrate and model vulnerability, which I think is something very important right now. That's the leader that I want to follow. And, and I think um, from an emotional contagion standpoint, um, being able to tap into that kind of leadership right now is going to, you know, arguably maximize that leader's influence. So I'm curious what what your thoughts are, Tali, on that, given your research? Yeah, I think I think this idea of um, sort of getting out of your own way. Uh, look, when we first started this study, we thought naively. I think I think the panel wouldn't have this hypothesis, but our starting hypothesis was that highly central people will pull everybody else to their own initial starting position. That um, they will bend other people's minds to their own, and that's what it means to be a central, influential person. And it was that we just found the complete opposite result, right? That the people who were highly central in their network were able to take on board other people's mental states and then rally other people around to those. So that's definitely um, flexibility, it's adaptability, and you have to, I think, have a degree of humility in order to, to let go of ego, right? Your idea wasn't the best one, but you can recognize who had the best idea and champion that. And when you speak, people trust that your contribution is worth listening to, right? So that all I think fits with this idea of being humble, but also being authentic. I'm gonna add a quick, uh, very brief thought, and then I, I think we're gonna open this up in a second. And that is, if you are running a startup and you have five employees, uh, we can pretty much tell them what to do. And like the deal is clear, it's very uh, personal. But think Marriott International, 175,000 employees, and the chief executive about a month ago uh, went on a uh, internal uh, video cast about five minutes. It's on the web. It's great to look at. And he did what I think we're talking about here, which is to help people make sense of the world they're all working in, understand the purpose of Marriott International, remind themselves uh, of why, why they're in business. And in that sense, uh, hit a, a, a kind of a call it a cultural, create a, um, reinforce and sustain a cultural tone and a sense making of the world we're in. And when we use the word authentic, I think we're probably referring, take Angela Merkel, she's been mentioned earlier. She's been very good at doing that with uh, the German people and actually throughout the European Union. And thus, I think we want authenticity, we want character in people who are managing more than a startup of a half dozen people to with thousands, Marriott International, 175 of those, to set the tone, help us appreciate what we stand for, what our purpose in life is, and in that sense, use culture in the way that individuals and a small group cannot. So anyway, I'll stop on that, Michael and Zab, back to you. Yeah, I, that's, that's really great. I, I'm gonna ask a very provocative question, which I think weaves together some of the questions we've been getting. So. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a study done um, by colleagues at Wharton and at Penn by uh, Diana Robertson um, and John Detre, Mark, Mark Korzakowski, and they uh, they basically brought um, MBA candidates in. Uh, they assessed them for their depth of moral reasoning, and then they did structural brain scans on them and found that, in fact, there were identifiable patterns, differences in the size of particular brain areas that um, that predicted how, or were correlated with how, how deeply one reasoned about the moral implications of one's actions. Um, and, and I think that, that 
the, those measures for a strong resemblance to what we're talking about here in terms of leadership um, and authenticity and, and, and responsibility. And so I wonder, you know, how far away do you think we are from a brain scan or a blood test for leadership potential? And if you're a company that, it, or a country that, you know, where millions of lives depend on that, should we do it? Michael, I love the question. I'm gonna let somebody else answer. Yeah, I, I'll, uh, we have tools that, you know, in many ways scratch the surface, you know, psychometric instrument, 60 assessment, observational data. Um, we are, we're not close, I don't think, to, to what we're trying to break. <laughs> I agree. I don't think we're close to sort of a litmus test, stuff someone in a scanner and see if they're a leader yet. Um, I don't think it's impossible to imagine that we'll figure out some core principles that we can sort of narrow the field down to these people have the kind of flexibility, the kind of adaptability in their mental processes that suggest they may be better than others. I don't, I think that's within reach. And Michael, so I, I guess I'm gonna... go ahead. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah, just so I also don't think we're there. I just want to point out that it's not just a question of developing the biological measures. I think the biological measures are there. I think we also have to really uh, think very careful what what types of leadership we want to actually identify and the particular context. It's possible that there's not the one type of leader, right? There's leaders for particular contexts and for particular tasks. And I think also there we have to do more work in order to actually get there. So um, I don't really want to give an estimate of, of, of uh, how long it will take, um, but I really think that we can all do a lot more research to get there. <laughs> and, and Michael, just to reinforce the point, I think we're all going to die very, very rich if we can come up with a pharmacological solution to the lack of leadership. And if you may recall from your youth, when you read some of those Piggly Wiggly novels or accounts, uh, there was a bad character and he was given a leadership pill and he became good. So there's the holy grail, may we get there. And maybe after we figure out how to solve COVID-19, maybe that would be our next agenda. <laughs> That's outstanding. I'm going to have to look that back up. Um, Zab, do you want to do you want to see if you can call from some of the the questions? Yeah, I think uh, Sid Patel has asked a few questions, but I'll let him, so I'll let him choose which which one might be the most relevant uh, to ask right now. Yeah, for sure. I think the first one uh, is kind of answered by the panel, so I appreciate that. The second one was to sort of the last point that Michael made on the study that was done with MBA candidates on brain patterns and how actions are driven with some sort of a moral connotation. Uh, I was just wondering, do you or anyone on the panel thinks, is it actions driving the formation of such patterns or is it somewhat uh, nature with certain patterns already there that's driving the actions to be sort of morally inclined or is it cyclical uh, over time? Um, so just, I guess, it, question to everyone. Anybody want to take that one? Yeah, well, the easy answer is both, right? <laughs> I, I think the, uh, you know, we, we have we have certain gifts. Everybody's got their unique set of strengths and, uh, and challenges that they've been endowed with. And, um, and we'll call that uh, nature and and then there's there's nurture um which is you know what we probably have even more control over right? and uh and somehow our our ability to learn i think that's really the 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 key to um to effectiveness it's not perfect it's not having a um you know an a plus record it's the ability to learn and to self reflect and uh and that's you know that that self is our unique um, uh, and but the ability to learn I think is a is probably uh, a very important variable for 
that differentiate, um, you know, high performing leaders um, from those that may have some some big wins, but then you know, come out or or no wins at all. So basically, perhaps if I can just uh, just quickly jump in for the vast majority of. Uh, behavioral tendencies that uh, neuroscience has studied. It's always been nature and nurture. It's a bit like Michael said before, uh, nature sets the range of the dial and then nurture basically sets where exactly in that range the dial is actually then expressed. Yeah? Um, I'm not sure people have really looked at this in great detail for morality, but uh, it would be surprising if this was an exception. So Christian, I have a follow-up question, you know, with, with regards to your, you know, measure of, of responsibility, right? Is that, is that like how much flexibility and change do people express over time uh, with that? You know, is, should that be a test that we put, you know, put forward for mm -hmm. anyone seeking a leadership uh, position? And how might that dovetail with what Talia, you know, with, with the, you know, the identified uh, sort of influencers that, that Talia, uh, you know, has found? Yeah, so 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 Talia's uh, study and our study are really quite complementary. They look at very different aspects in my eyes. I don't know how Talia sees it, but but I see that what Talia is looking at is how people in a group emerge to be leaders, right? And, and I think it has a lot to do, as we heard, with social skills, with the ability to project yourself into others and so forth. Whereas what we looked at was really, are people willing to lead? Like, do they take... Do they take the choice that they will take responsibility? Uh, um, and then, of course, we also looked at whether that willingness was correlated with real life leadership ability. Now, you're absolutely right. We cannot say from that study whether people were born that way, and that's why they, they show these two skills, or whether they learned over the leadership challenges that they were faced with in their life to basically choose very consistently. We can't say that at the moment, and I think no one can, and that's really a very interesting question that one really ought to look at. But what I found interesting is just that this very particular decision style didn't relate to anything else in our toolkit as behavioral economists of how we can characterize decision abilities. So I have a hunch that it really is something unique and that there is also some some contribution of uh, that's not just learned. You know? but. Um, but I can't really back that up at the moment. And I think one would really have to look at training studies. And I think for all of these things, this is really what we ought to do in neuroscience. That's that's something, it, it, it takes longer than the studies that we usually do. Uh, and it's harder to do logistically, uh, but it seems to be a question that everyone is fascinated by and that's highly relevant. To what degree can we change all these things? And we really would have to do that over years. And I think Talia, you have a good, have good data sets along this perspective. We don't have that yet, have that yet, but we're hoping to also do something like this. Great. I just very quickly. Um, one thing that I think um, I think speaks to the nurture side potentially is we found that if you look across cohorts of MBA students, the people who become highly central in these networks tend to hail from places countries, even counties at the U.S. level, that are quite diverse. So we looked at um, all the countries in the world, uh, 500 years of migration patterns, and people who come from countries that have had a lot of migration, so it's Canada, Brazil, places like that, um, tend to, when they come, at least in the to the environment of an MBA program in the U.S., they tend to become highly central in their network. And same is true at the county level in the US, that if you hail from a county that has a lot of international ties in terms of Facebook data, that you are more likely to become highly central in this new context. So it suggests at least that there might be something about having to adapt yourself to a diverse environment that is useful to becoming uh, an influencer in your network. That's you know, that's some of the coolest stuff I've I've ever seen, Talia. It's really uh, amazing. I, I we're nearing the end of our time, and I kind of by way of an exit question, um, I wanted to ask all of the panelists. You're all leaders in you know in your fields. You're leaders of labs. You're leaders of companies, think tanks, whatever. What have you taken from your own research to help you be a better leader?
All right, Michael, I'll, I'll pick up on that. Uh, and I know we got to be very brief. Uh, here's what I've actually picked up, not only from my own uh, thinking and research, but also what we've said today. Some people are going to have a head start. They come from a, a, a province where there's a lot of migration, for example. Uh, some are just wired to be more extrovertish than introvertish. But for me, I turn that upside down and I say, therefore, and I know Richard Marcus is with us today, who's one of our leadership coaches uh, in the school that I teach in. Uh, if I'm going to work with somebody that has a head start in one area, I'm going to coach them differently uh, because they may not be the authentic, authentic kind of character we want. So great to combine, in my view, the, uh, the, the biological wiring with the fact that uh, the implication for me is as we work, worry about developing leadership, uh, we want to know what they bring, and then we can build appropriately upon that. So I'll end on that. Michael, I can um, um, share from that point there's the importance of self leadership and that being um, somewhat of a um, prerequisite being a master project before going out into the world meeting others. And so even though a lot of us are not traveling, <laughs> um, you know, when, when you go on an airplane and they say, put your seatbelt on first, put your face mask on first, um, that's really, I think, the, uh, the core message that, um, that I take away from um, individual performance and, um, and it's particularly Resilient right now um, um, in times of crisis and leadership, leadership is, is so, so important. Yeah, I mean, um, perhaps I can just, just briefly mention that because the work that we do is so interdisciplinary and we <laughs> combine people with so many different uh, uh, expertise in so many different domains, I've, I've come to really appreciate that. Um, that the sum is more than the parts and uh, we can only achieve something in teams and uh, if you want to lead such a team what you have to do is uh, is not do the same thing with every person and for everyone but to always try to take the perspective of everyone what is it that they know how is it that they see things and then try to basically uh, get people where they stand and and try to put them together and give every, everyone a shared meaning and i think once once a group has a shared meaning it almost works by itself, uh, but it takes a leader to actually create that. I think, um, and this actually uh, feeds off of uh, Sam, I believe, in the in the chat, um, who was interested in the paradox between adaptability and consistency. And what I, I think I take away from what I've been hearing and my own research is that people want leaders that have a consistent vision but they have adaptability within that consistency. So they trust in an authentic core and a, and a global sort of vision of where they wanna go. But then they have the humility to accept that there are many paths to get there, right? So it's this uh, ability to be flexible and humble and, uh, and adapt within a core uh, vision of where you want the group to go. And I think that's what I take leadership to be. Great. Well, that wraps up today's session. Thank you guys so much for an outstanding discussion um, and for agreeing to take part. It's been really, really great.